What is the significance of the melting Arctic? Well, the significance of the melting Arctic uh, is, number one, it's a warning signal. Um, we'd always thought that this is where we'd see the change first, where it would be most pronounced, and that's exactly what's happening. Uh, so again, as I said before, it's a case where, you know, we told you this was going to happen and here it is. So it's kind of that red flag out there uh, telling us that, hey, climate change is real uh, and it's happening just pretty much the way we, we thought it would unfold. Uh, but in terms of impacts uh, of the melting uh, ice in the Arctic, uh, we already touched upon the issue of sea level rise. The Greenland ice sheet is losing mass. Arctic glaciers and ice caps are losing mass. They're melting down. Uh, and that's uh, contributing to sea level rise. We're losing the sea ice cover. Uh, now that uh, doesn't itself affect sea level rise, but the loss of ice is very tied in with this thing we call Arctic amplification, which is the observation, which, and this is something that was uh, predicted a long time ago, the observation that the warming that we're seeing across the globe is most pronounced in the Arctic. The Arctic is warming at something like twice the rate um, as the rest of the planet. Why does that matter? Weather impacts. If we look at what drives the weather machine in the first place, why we have storms with warm fronts and cold fronts and things like that, it's, the, it's Mother Nature's way of transporting heat from areas where it's warm in the tropics up into the Arctic where it's colder. In nature, everything wants to go down the gradient from high temperature to low temperature. And when we have a storm come through, it's doing its job of mixing that air, transporting the warm air poleward, the cold air equatorward, mixing the air properties up. That's what the atmosphere does. And it's all driven on the predication that the Arctic is cold and the lower latitudes are warm because, of course, the Arctic doesn't get as much solar radiation, sunlight, as in the south. Well, we're warming the Arctic at this outsized rate. Well, that means we're messing with that temperature gradient, that basic temperature difference between the low and the high latitudes. We're messing with it. If we mess with that temperature gradient, something's got to give. The atmospheric circulation has got to respond to that and adjust to that. There's very good evidence out there that this Arctic warming, this Arctic amplification we're talking about, is actually having impact on what we call the jet stream which is then having impact on weather patterns right down here in mid-latitudes. It's still a controversial issue, uh, but uh, many scientists are working on it. The one other issue about the Arctic is what we call permafrost carbon feedback. If you look across the Arctic, uh, there's, uh, most of the Arctic is underlain by permafrost. The land areas are underlain by permafrost, perennially frozen ground. There's a heck of a lot of carbon uh, in this permafrost old frozen peatlands, things like that. There's more carbon stored in these permafrost areas than it's in the atmosphere today. We're warming up the Arctic. What happens to that permafrost? It starts to warm. It starts to thaw. When it starts to thaw, the little critters in the soil, the microbes, become active. They breathe. What do they breathe out? Carbon dioxide, methane. So in other words, you warm things up, you thaw the permafrost, that results in more input of carbon dioxide or methane to the atmosphere to further the warming. It's another reason why we should be thinking about what's going on in the Arctic. The issue with the permafrost carbon feedback is that once it's started, it's hard to put the genie back in the bottle. Can you expand a little bit more on the title of your, your book, yeah. Brave New Arctic? Well, Brave New Arctic, it, uh, actually I didn't choose that title. I had a different title, but the publisher chose that title. Uh, I thought it was a little Aldous Huxley-ish, right? Brave New World, okay. But uh, it does resonate a bit because it is a new Arctic and we're bravely marching forward into the future, not quite knowing where we're going to end up. Uh, but uh, again, as I said, that's what this book is all about. It's about this transformation of the Arctic, how it happened, and how scientists came together to understand this. Uh, and the pitfalls along the way, the stumbles that we made along the way, it's really a story about science and about scientists. It really tries to humanize the science. Hey, you know, scientists are people too.
What were you thinking of calling it? The New Arctic Explorers. That's what I was going to call it. Uh, because we had the Arctic Explorers of old, of the 19th, say, and 18th century. And now we have the new generation of Arctic Explorers who are the scientists who are trying to understand the changes that are unfolding in the Arctic. I thought it was a nice title, but uh, uh, the publisher, uh, we had some talks on this, and they thought that this other title would be better. So, uh, again, I thought it was a little Aldous Huxley-ish, but... Uh, what proof do you have for people that say climate change is a natural thing? Okay, well, the issue, of course, is Earth climate has always changed. Uh, it's, it's been changing ever since, basically, uh, uh, the Earth was put together. Um, but the thing about past climate change, or any climate change, is that it has a reason. Every climate change has a physical reason driving it. It's not as if Harry, pa Harry Potter can flick his magic wand and say, climate change. It doesn't work that way. All climate change is caused by something. What could be that something? Uh, in the past, uh, it has been anything from uh, variations in solar output uh, to variations in the Earth's orbit about the sun, what we call Milankovitch effects. Uh, to periods of continental drift or volcanic eruptions, uh, asteroid impacts, right? Uh, any of these can force a climate change. So climate change never just happens by itself. But of course, past climate change is what we call natural, right? It wasn't caused by humans, but it still had a cause. Now, the most recent climate change that we're seeing now over the past century or so, it absolutely has a cause because the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is rising, and uh, we have understood how certain gases in the atmosphere absorb what we call infrared radiation, certain wavelengths of it, and re-emit that radiation. We've understood this for more than a century uh, in terms of how these gases behave. I mean, this is, uh, there's all kinds of modern technologies out there that are based on these sorts of understandings. Everything from microwave ovens to uh, heat sinking missiles to what we call infrared spectroscopy. So we know what greenhouse gases in the atmosphere do. We've understood that for a long time. Well, now they're rising. Why? Why are they rising? Us. Our fingerprints are all over that in terms of, for example, what we call the isotopic composition of the carbon in the atmosphere. No doubt it is us. Uh, no doubt that if we add greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, it will warm. That is the climate forcing today. All climate change has a cause. We know what the cause is of this. Who is the IPCC? Uh, what have they said about climate change? And do you think they're being too conservative? Well, the IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, which is a form of scientists from all over the world uh, to try and come up with these assessments of what the climate is doing and where it is going. Um, it's authored by thousands of scientists uh, from all over the world, and it's intended as sort of a consensus view. Uh, a number of what we call IPCC reports have been put out. Uh, we've, we're now moving past the fifth to the sixth IPCC assessment. and. Um, my view, having been part of this process uh, through the years, it's a fairly fair consensus on what is going to happen. Certainly, one can always nitpick parts of this. Um, I think there's all, still a lot of uncertainty on what the rates of sea level rise are going to be because there's a lot about what's going on in Antarctica that we don't quite understand. Maybe conservative on that side, uh, but I think overall the IPCC is a very fair assessment. Sure, you can criticize parts of it, nitpick parts of it. It is a human process put together by real people and real scientists that maybe have their biases. Uh, but I think overall, it's been a very, very successful uh, effort. And uh, we should not dismiss it. We should embrace it. Why are universities talking about this more and taking aggressive action? Well, why are universities uh, talking about this more? Of course, this is where a lot of the research is done. Uh, now, of course, there's uh, research in government, uh, like NOAA, for example, and NASA, for example. 
uh, but a great deal of the research uh, in uh, terms of climate change is done within uh, the universities, such as my university. I'm from the University of Colorado, which is actually a national leader uh, in environmental sorts of studies, uh, climate studies. Uh, but uh, this is just what universities do. I mean, this, these are seats of learning and understanding. Uh, we and universities work often closely um, with scientists in the government. We partner with each other. Uh, but uh, it's just universities, those are seats of learning. This is where a lot of this research is done. Why aren't politicians talking about this more and taking aggressive action? Why aren't politicians talking about this more and taking aggressive action? Some of them are, right? Uh, but uh, uh, many are quite reluctant uh, because uh, part of their constituency uh, maybe doesn't want to hear this, uh, the issues of climate change, or they don't want to take action because it'll be viewed as uh, having some sort of economic impact uh, you know, against their, uh, uh, their interests. Uh, and so unfortunately, our politicians uh, seem to be uh, beholden right, to, uh, uh, to industry views uh, too often uh, and not thinking really about the bigger picture. Uh, but it depends on the politicians. Uh, our current administration is not particularly friendly uh, in the sense of uh, addressing climate change. Uh, let us hope that the uh, next one has more eager ears. Why aren't the scientists talking about this more and taking aggressive action? Why aren't the scientists talking about this more? I, uh, I don't agree with that. I think the scientists have been on the forefront of this, of getting the word out. Um, now, there's been an evolution uh, among scientists in the science community. Uh, for uh, a long time, scientists, most of them were content just uh, doing their work and their research in their office or in the field or wherever they do it. Uh, and really not reaching out. They communicate with other scientists through peer-reviewed papers and things like that or at scientific conferences. Uh, but we've seen a big shift in that uh, over in recent decades, that, it is, that most scientists understand now there's more to it, that you have to be able to reach out. You have to be able to try and communicate the science to public uh, and to uh, policymakers. Um, so we're seeing uh, a big change uh, in, in that way. Not all scientists, certainly. There are some who really can't deal with this. There are others like myself who have taken it on themselves to be much more vocal. Uh, so we're seeing big shifts. We're seeing big shifts in other ways. Uh, for example, uh, science, like climate science, uh, used to be very a male-dominated thing. No longer, no longer. I look at like, the class I'm teaching now, it's about uh, Oh, 35 undergraduates, more than half is women now, right? You're seeing this shift now uh, in that it's understood that, you know, uh, what you're appreciated for is, is what's up here and how you can communicate that. Uh, so the whole science community is really changing, and I think we've been very, very strong uh, in being outspoken about what is going on. The challenge is communication. Too many scientists talk like scientists and they talk in their jargon and things like this, and it goes over people's heads. No, you've got to be able to connect at a different level. You know, why is the United States government not concerned about climate change? Yes, well, I would say that parts of the United States government are concerned with climate change. Uh, uh, our elected leaders, uh, many of them are not. Uh, when we say the United States being concerned, yeah. Our armed forces, Department of Defense is all over this. The Navy is very well aware of climate change and concerned about it. As I mentioned before, why? One thing, sea level rise. Uh, naval ports are at sea level. Uh, what's happening in the Arctic where we lose the sea ice cover? I've had Navy people talk to me, and one of them said, hey, I don't even care why we're losing the sea ice, but what I see now is we have a blue ocean there, which we didn't have before. I've got to deal with it. Uh, uh, the Army is very interested in this uh, because of uh, uh, in terms of changes to the landscape, uh, the operational environment that they call it. Um, so it depends on who you talk to. Uh, but uh, for example, DOD, Department of Defense, they're very, very pragmatic about this. They see what they see. Um, unfortunately, our elected officials seem to be less, uh, less receptive to, uh, to the views. Why isn't the EPA talking more about this and taking more aggressive action? Well, the EPA has been aggressive. Uh, however, the EPA has been muzzled 
uh, to a certain extent uh, by this administration. Uh, some have argued that maybe the EPA has overstepped in some areas. Uh, that's an uh, issue for a different debate. Uh, but uh, uh, the EPA, we entrust them on enforcing these environmental regulations. And uh, what shocks me with this current administration is that uh, we're seeing those regulations eroded. And that is exactly the opposite of what we need to be doing right now. Why isn't the media talking more about this? Well, again, I, uh, why the media isn't talking more about this, I think the media is. So I think that that question is, uh, uh, the premise is incorrect. Uh, the media is all over this. Just watch CNN or something like that. Now, of course, uh, um, you might want to look at Fox News, right? Maybe they have a, a different view on this thing. Uh, but I think the media has been all over this. And um, especially uh, on some of the impacts of climate change. So. Um, I don't think it's fair to say that the media has, has really not been more outspoken about this. Their job is to report the news, right? Um, I'm interviewed uh, on a weekly basis, sometimes a daily basis, depending on what's happening, on issues of what's happening in the Arctic. People want to know. Uh, so I don't think it's fair to say that the media has not been all over this. They have.